Well, when I'm not teaching in the classroom, then uh, you know I've got a number of interests. Uh, one of my primary ones lately has been police accountability and how do we ensure that type of accountability uh, to the general public. And, and it's been in the news lately, so actually it's nice that way that it's topical. Uh, and how do you try to ensure, bring some sense of accountability to police in their exercise of discretion? If we give them a great deal of power, then how do we hold them accountable for those exercises of power? And there have been a number of changes. For example, it's interesting in Ontario because in the last 15 years, there have been about three, four schemes uh, that have developed in different levels and types of accountability, accountability to civilians for the types of decisions which are made. And so how do we hold them accountable, not only at the individual level, which is much easier, so you have a, a bad cop who does something, but at the agency level. So if the agency encourages in the way it supervises officers, for example, it, it allows for uh, bad practices, like the way sexual assault victims might be treated, or domestic violence uh, individuals, or racial profiling in terms of stopping individuals. Uh, if the agency allows for that, then how do we ensure agency accountability? And it's, it's a huge problem. How do we make them accountable? We obviously don't want police officers and police agencies to be under the direct control of their political masters, but how do we make them uh, accountable for their decisions in some way? And it's been a very real problem, not only in Ontario, but obviously if one looks at a lot of the examples in, uh, in regard to the RCMP. Uh, in the last few years. Huge problems about holding them accountable, not in a sort of reactive punishment way, but in the sense of how do you get better decisions out of them so that you have a better agency, a better police officer being hired and trained and so on, to get better decisions coming out at the other end. And so I think one of the problems has been, from an accountability point of view, focusing on punishing an individual bad apple rather than, well, how do we get a better environment, uh, whether it's from a training or a supervisory point of view, a better hiring process that gets good officers in there that are good supervisors, that are good administrators, that encourage good discretion, uh, exercises of discretion, decision making. I found a huge change lately, not only with distance learning, I think that's probably the smaller part of it, but I find with students in the classroom. A huge difference in the sense of being on campus. So many of them have to work, you know, a lot of them are working 30, 40 hours a week. And so that presence of students on campus, I think it, it hasn't been particularly good for the quality, I think, in terms of uh, quality of life for students and, and profs. I think that's, that interchange is wonderful. But uh, that said, if this is the reality, then how do we sort of adapt to that reality and at least make ourselves more available in another sphere. And so, you know, the use of whether it's Skype or the big blue button which we have here on, on campus, uh, the ability to reach out and make yourself available in that virtual form is, uh, it, it's good. And so I think that's a positive because I think there has been that negative in just the experience unrelated to distance education, there's been that experience of just fewer and fewer people around. Uh, and for that physical interaction, face-to-face -face interaction. And so it, it's, it can help to fill the gap.